Here we go. Hey. So, hey, listen, welcome to the Breakfast Club, I guess. And let me tell you something. I've never had this. So this, I'm going to do this live because I, I was shaking it up and you and you said this is awesome. But uh, Trident Coffee, San Diego, opened up a new office in Coronado. So I'm really excited about this. And uh, what did you say that these guys were? Like military, you were breaking it down? So they uh, are uh, Navy, Navy veteran, a Navy veteran owned business. And uh, they uh, make a great, great coffee, all natural MCT oils monk fruit and uh, they have a bunch of different kinds uh, i'm having the peanut butter and banana keto latte mm. uh, which is really really good mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're a great company they're a great organization so i highly recommend give uh, back to all to of our listeners who, uh, who are serving yep that's right give back to a veteran owned business we also had a peppermint one yes that we had during christmas they have uh they have different flavors and some of them are seasonal yeah for a better term tasting those chocolate vanilla creamy love it mm -hmm. And then it says here, Cajamarca, mm -hmm. the Ambrotos Peru Cajamarca, infused with MCT oil, man. So this is good stuff. Hold on. Got to record this. Boom. Oh, look at that. Does that go live? That's the beauty of or it. Or just records? Just records. It just records okay. the entire time. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything. Just, just, just. So, Straight to Mark. <laughs> hey, you, you were talking about something interesting. I wanted to kick this thing off because I, I always thought it was interesting before, and I think it's interesting today, and it's going to be interesting tomorrow especially for people that are not in the security world. And it's this concept that there's like agricultural terrorism or agriculture, like big nails in trees because people don't <laughs> want you to cut down trees kind of thing. I have absolutely no clue about that. That's yeah. been going on for decades. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I, 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 you know, until you brought it up, I was like, man. What the? Yeah, we were talking about kind of threats and risks to supply chain and things like that. And and we're seeing a definite uptick in agricultural, what I'll just call agro-terrorism or, or you know, protesters who probably mean more well than they, they understand what they're doing. And they're using what, what are called monkey wrenching techniques. Mm -hmm. And so they go up into the, the forest and, and uh, where you're, you're collecting agriculture, or you're cutting down trees for, for turning into wood products and things like that. And sure enough, they're, one of the things that they try to do to keep um, what's called a sawyer or somebody who, who cuts down these trees to keep them from being able to do that. That one of the tactics, one of the many tactics is that they'll, they'll drive a, a, a railroad spike into a tree. It doesn't hurt the tree. The tree continues to grow, which is what they want, but they also do these things to harm yeah, human it, beings. It fouls your harvesting techniques. Right? Not, it, not only use... that, it could kill somebody. Oh yes. So absolutely. when you, you have, you know, we, we use chainsaws or houses that are you know maybe uh, 12 16 inch um, uh, chain uh, blades but out in in you know when you're cutting down very large trees you're using 16 uh, feet chainsaws huge things on on big mechanical arms or you have these handheld ones that are, are huge as well mm -hmm. but uh, the the problem is when you drive that stake in there and the chains going around and it separates from the blade that could come off and, and kill the soy, kill the, the person who's who's operating the machine. Holy cow. And so, you know, this that's nothing new. They put sugar in gas tanks of, of uh, tracked vehicles that are used for bulldozing or, or land clearing, things like that. Um, and I and I think this is we're, we're going to start. My my belief is that we'll start seeing a definite uptick in these type types of activities. And so when we were talking about like threats to supply chains. The, with the UN climate change report that came out earlier this year, or late last year, I can't remember, um, there is going to be an uptick in these kind of agro-terrorism or environmental um, act activist type type uh, issues because they believe that the the clock is ticking. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're we're having tough times, isn't it? Wait, so are you having are you having problems with environmentalists? Or are you having problems with Local folks that like, hey, my tree, not your yeah, tree. Kind of, kind of a little. We're, the, there's a little bit of everything, right? Um, politicians are are elected by local people, and sometimes the smallest voices are the loudest, and so they listen to that, and then they they create problems for industry, especially heavy industry that's working on manufacturing and things like that. And their belief, see this a lot in the Pacific Northwest with. The attempt to protect uh, old old growth trees 
and um, they're taking extreme measures where they're blocking traffic or they're they're uh, chaining themselves to things, gluing themselves to things. It's apparently a new wow. tactic, by the way, um, where they take, I don't know, super glue and they, they'll glue themselves to a building. We saw this in London just recently, mm-hmm. in the last couple of yeah. months, where there was, it was a um, uh, African oil conference. And so you had European oil manufacturers talking with African leaders, trying to get agreements in place and things like that. And... A, a well-known protest group went and disrupted the conference with, with by, you know, chaining themselves to things, gluing themselves to things, and law enforcement really doesn't have an answer for this. They right. kind of just let them do what, do what they do, and they disrupt everything and they, for a little while, and, and they get their message out. And you know, that's really, I don't think anybody really has a problem with that. And disrupting a conference isn't isn't appropriate, but you know. Uh, Holding signs, chanting, banging a drum, those kinds of things are, are all part of our First Amendment, at least in the States. And I don't think anybody has a problem. The problem is when they take it to the next step, when they don't believe that they're, that is working. And that the next step, usually this escalation that we've seen. Is that become, it becomes criminal. It does. Yeah, and, and then see. they start occupying lands. So, you know, specifically speaking about agriculture, you have um, blockades that occur on private property. So imagine if you had what they call a woodlot or, or, or you had a grove of trees that you're trying to harvest um, and they blocked your access to that property. Now they block, blocked your access to your livelihood. Yeah. You know, and um, there's you're not going around them because it's forest and it would cost way too much money to plow more roads or to, to make more roads. Right. So you, you these types of activities are really starting to, and will continue, I think, to impact um, how we we plant things, how we grow things, how we harvest things. Um, it, we get the same thing with uh, people who who utilize animals for for slaughter, mm-hmm. right? So whether you're talking about uh, chickens or, or cows or whatever, they're are, they have the same challenges where these activists will break into their facilities and release the animals to the wild. Well, these animals have never been in the wild, right? right? right. And so there's <clears throat> horrific experiences in, in uh, the Midwest where these, these animals are running across highways, getting run over by semis and things like that. And the activists who are, again, these folks aren't, aren't trying to be disruptive, um, for any other reason that they believe what they're doing will help humanity, right? So, you know, that's a bit of an honorable thing, but their tactics are harming industry, right? They're harming people's jobs. And so this is going to be it's considerable going change. Yeah. So as you are saying, I was thinking like uh, biopharmaceutical companies, you know, the rats, right? Or, yeah. Because they Correct. need the testing rat bunnies, whatever it is that they're testing on. I mean, the amount of security that goes into one of those places where they're testing, man, it's pretty, you know, pretty great. And once they find out where they are located, man, these people are on the door, knocking on doors, and you know, so it becomes real difficult. Who's more important, the yeah. animal or the human? Well, and we have a, a, a culture now that makes it okay to either cancel or to disrupt or to speak out the speak up culture, which is not none of these things are bad. This is just the way it is. Right. Not being native one way or the other, but what I what it challenged for security professionals like us is how do you um, how do you hire this next generation of people and then put parameters around them so that they aren't leaking information, taking videos of the inside of your facilities yeah. to show and document and demonstrate to activists potentially you know what happens in your facility. Well, I, and I, that's challenge. I, I think it begs the, the larger question when you're talking about you know if I block a roadway into a facility. It's not just a private property security issue. Right. It's where's that liaison and leverage with the local law enforcement teams. And largely they are becoming so overwhelmed with activity that they're going to have to, to, they don't draw a line, but you know, back in the day when my 1990, you know, Volkswagen hit your Toyota, I could probably get a, a law enforcement response to do an accident investigation. Right. All that stuff's gone now, Go right? Yeah. Private property crime, non-injury crime. You, you, you log on it's to the local, issue. right. Log on to Maricopa, helpme.gov, yep. right? Click file a police report, and you will never talk to or see an officer. Um, our officers are, are far more often engaged in things 
that are a higher and higher level of risk. So A, you know, we've got to do a better job of risk assessments and mitigation and then training, right? You've got to, you've got to train, uh, it's not a security issue until something happens. So you've got to train your, your team, whatever team it is in, in this example, it's, you know, the, the logging industry and how they're going to safely remove, you know, the, the logs. Now they've got to spend additional time inspecting every thing before they cut it to make sure that it hasn't been booby trapped or there's yeah. no hazard. Yeah. yeah, it is a, it is a, it's almost like making everybody a, a security professional these days. Because well, those, those are what right. you, sawyers, right? Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden they're, they're your they're own your security ideas. folks out there. Yep. I'm sure you don't have a security convoy with you out in the middle of the woods when you cut no. trees. No, right. that's too expensive. Yeah. You know, it, and it, it, it would be the same thing if we were, you were raising cattle for slaughter. You know, we're not going to be putting additional security around those transporta- that transportation. The security standard for you know, agricultural security is, may include fence lines, right? Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, it's just really difficult. Keep the cattle here. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. But where we're going in the world, you know, the number one uh, exporter of wheat invaded the number four exporter of wheat. So here we are, we're going to be going into the fall with a, a, a deficit of wheat products yeah. going around the world. So how to now that puts us constraint on that supply chain and that we get this ripple effect or what they call the butterfly effect, right? Where one something happens in one part of the world will affect what's happening on the other part. Of the world. Who, who knows who's listening to this, right? But yeah. you know, you'll often get the question, we all kind of understand what we're talking about, but you know, if you go to the mall and do one of the Jay Leno man on the street interviews, sure. hey, are you having a problem with supply chain? Do you think it's impacting your life? Yeah. Well, people may be more aware now because of the you know, the baby formula shortage. Yep. Right. But if you go back to the California Harbor, you know, four or five months ago, there was a line of hundreds, if not thousands, of vessels Ships. waiting to get into the port. Anchorage. Yep. Right? Yeah. Because of a lack of, of workers, you know, either to offload or to inspect or to truck, you know. We were just they, talking about that. The, the trucking challenges in California, yeah. you know, the belief was can't get enough of them. Yeah. Now California's changed a law recently. We were just talking about this. That, the truckers don't, or they're not, uh, they're contractors or they're not full-time employees or whatever it is. Um, but either way, it's upset the truckers. Mm-hmm. Well, they and just so, protested the other day. And they were just protesting. Yeah. And what what do they do? Blo- the, the tactic is block the roads. Right. Yep. So if down you, at the port. Right. Yeah. yeah, down at the port. So if you're trying to get around for your day and you're trying to get to work or whatever you're trying to do, trying to get to the hospital, now you have to deal with protest <laughs> activity that you've never had to before. Yeah, which which is another interesting thing because you know dealing with with protesters um, in the security industry, it's it's difficult, man, because mm-hmm. it's something that you could try to mitigate for, but like you said, there's not much that we can do. When a you, lot of the you time remember, we all are like post 9-11 security experts, right? So you guys remember when after right after nine eleven. All the security people in, out in the world would call law enforcement and say, hey, so we just took a picture of my facility. And I was on the Joint Terrorism Task Force at the time, and I called it felony photography because, you know, first of all, it's, if they're on public property, it's not a crime. It's Correct. not an issue. And I kept telling the FBI, we don't care about this until we care about it, right? And so could it be pre-operational surveillance, blah, 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 of course. But let's track the trend. You know, if we get a plate, we get a description of vehicle, we get a description of person. And if we start seeing that same pattern emerge someplace else, then let's look into it. But no, no, no. After 9-11, everything, every person who's taking a picture or something, you guys had this. Every, everything was like a suspicious activity. Everything was everything suspicious. Was suspicious activity. Yeah. Like somebody would come up, you know, to, to uh, a resort entrance, right, and say, hey, I'm trying to get to Universal Studios. Huh. Clearly, are you, you see, really? this is not universal. Are Studios. you really? <laughs> yeah. Are you, you taking you know, penetration you know, tests? Instead of just going, yes, yeah, sir, turn around here, you make a left, you take I-4, no, yeah. It's real simple stuff. But no, no, you got to write that down. Yeah. Did you get the tag? <laughs> were, were you able to look inside? Were you able to look inside a vehicle? Yeah, a guy with a goofy hat. <laughs> <laughs> two two six year olds in princess costume. <laughs> but but you're right. I think it's we took cover. it. We took it's it to a level. We took it to a level that was kind of yeah. you know totally different. And I think some companies have stayed there. I, but then when that's what you bring up that level, yeah. it's like you stay there and you go, uh, the threat's no longer there, guys. Let's right. bring it back down. 
But sometimes we forget to do that. We, we have a real inability in business to adapt to emerging threats. Real inability. And this is where we talk about security, physical security, as a strategy that can really help the enterprise business. Right. And really mitigate that risk or at least understand the risk. I don't you know, I don't know that any physical security team is really, truly impacting the day to day operation in a positive way, by the way, of their organization. But we should be really trying to do that. You know, how can we help our organization at least just understand the risks? You know, you can try to go into business in Ukraine, but, you know, will there be Ukraine in the future? You know. You can try to go to, to business in, in some place that's going to be affected by global climate change, or do you really want to try to shift and adapt? Well, if they're not, we have eyes and boots on the ground in many of these places. And that you're, you're going to this, you know, what can security do? We we're talking about protests, right? And protest activity, we're not necessarily going to know until they show up at the front gate. I mean, that's a big challenge, right? We want to know. We want to have eyes and ears as far out as possible so that we can understand how this might disrupt our business. Yeah. But if we don't, if we aren't, if our physical security people are not actively looking and listening, we'll never know until it's right in our face. Well, I, I think that's that's the age-old question when yeah. you're dealing with your stakeholders at any, at any corporate level, right, is do I have too much physical security? Right. You know, I want I want a couple of access control points. I want one out on my property line and then I want one further in. Sure. Well, you don't need one on your property line. Well, I don't until I have 50 protesters now at the innermost gate That's right. prohibiting business. Yeah. yeah. Right? Then the question from the C-suite is, why did you let these guys get all the way up to here? That's right. Well, because, and again, risk transference, right? Yeah. <laughs> because when we were building our security plan, yeah. our logistics plan, the security plan, you were able to accept this level of risk, Mr. CEO, yep. right? Yeah. We told you about the risk. We said it would be good to have a checkpoint here for, you know, media, trust, you know, press, um, other other large groups, right? Just random trucks that may turn in and foul your your, your traffic flow. Yeah. But you didn't want it, yep. right, for whatever reason. And you so, accepted it. Yes. It. Here we so are. So when we <laughs> removed it and now you moved closer into your facility, uh, you might have observation out here awareness but you know you can't do anything about it you know what i'm seeing funny you say that right is that a lot of companies now are building their fence line inside of their property line already oh yeah they're giving up so it makes it two three hundred yards of just clear space. just stuff like that you want to want to do what you got to do however our property line starts see that corner down there yeah have a good day yeah you know and, and that works that was one of the beauties about Walt Disney World. Now, go ahead and take a sip, yeah. sir. Ah. That was one of the beauties about Walt yeah. Disney World. It's because people would come in. You know, I remember when we opened uh, Animal Kingdom. Animal rights groups were like, what the oh, hell sure. are you right. doing? Yeah, any yeah. zoos have any, the same problems. Yeah. Same thing. Uh, whenever we had incidents or issues, the beauty about it is that we had downtown Disney, which is Hotel Boulevard, goes all the way out into an area that we used to own and we saw that. But all the media had to be on the backside of downtown Disney which is about as as north from the property as you could get, away from the other 43 square miles. Sure. That was just a beautiful thing because protesters would go out there. It, it was right in front of the Walt Disney World sign, but it was nowhere close to the magic. Right. Right. So we weren't bothering the guests and the people. So that's a, you know, a great, great So religion. location matters. And, and what we're seeing, Dave and I have dealt with protesters for quite some time. We both were on the SWAT team for Department of Energy. And so... You know, as you may or may not know, nukes are, are controversial. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. yeah. So we would every year, certain times of year, we would always get the protesters. And so what we saw back in the 90s were protesters would show up and it was granny and, you know, and maybe some young college kids. And they would chain themselves to the fence. But we knew they were coming. We wristbanded them. Be like, okay, this, these people are going to get arrested. Not like this. No, no, no. They, you know, just a wristband. Just a wristband. I know. You need to do you guys know. use pink that I'm, day? I'm just or clarify. It, it depends. Yeah, it was the color of the day. Color of the, color of the day. Of course. Yeah. And, and so they would be grouped by if they were being arrested for trespassing or not. The, the funny thing for me, and you probably remember this, is we had a number of entrances into the facility and they would, we designated an area for them to protest. There was a sign there that said, once of lab and yeah. you know, they could get out there and they could pick it and do all their their thing um we'd close that gate 
and we just opened the back gate, and that's why all the employees this is still working. But, but it was literally timed. Yes, yeah. just remember I was uh, working there, yeah. and I all of a sudden the radio, I'd be working that one gate. Okay, close time gate. to close the yeah. gate. Yeah, yeah. go out there and close the gate. Yeah. And lock it up. <laughs> But okay, guys, we are here. We're just gonna we're gonna stop our entire business just for you. You want? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They open the back gate. Yeah, open the back gate. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's it's it, you know we talk about security theater in kind of a negative context a lot of times, but this is a little bit of security theater too, mm -hmm. where it's a little bit of misdirection. Hey, yeah, you protest like it's good. First Amendment, go ahead. Yeah. Um, even though you're blocking private property and so on, and but they felt like they could get their their <clears throat> message across. And that was what was important to them was we want to protest and we want pe people to understand what we're saying and why we're saying it. The difference today is now they don't listen when you say, hey, guys, let's be in this group right here. Go ahead and protest. Do whatever you want to do. Now that because of when I was on Joint Terrorism Task Force, we called it Black Block. And it was a tactic where, where they would wear balaclavas or they would cover their face. They would have balaclavas. Colors. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, they would they would um, wear all black. And they, so then they all look the same. They have backpacks. They've got water bottles full of concrete and, you know, bricks and rocks and things like that. It, it's a tactic, right? Or urine. Or, or urine, yeah. yeah. And or and bear spray and things oh, like yeah. that. All the stuff that we now see in the January 6th riots and what we see in protests from 2021 in the summer and and those are all, that's all stuff that they've been doing for several decades, but it came out of the kind of the radical anarchists of the 80s and 90s, and that transformed, and now everybody does it, right? Because we have media, and then people can learn yeah, how to do yeah, this yeah. online. Shoot, some of these protest groups hold trainings in how to even how to approach, protest. how to walk together, how to move together. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, just exactly how we in law enforcement would train riot control, yeah. exactly. wedge formation. Yeah, right. Diamonds, diamond stuff. Me, right? Yep. You know, stomp and drag. Shit, and do all this. Are we talking about EP work here or what? Yeah, <laughs> kind of similar. And, and to compound that, you don't always have, or maybe these days you rarely have, just one group, right? Uh, I've got my organization, whatever governmental or private company that it is, yeah. and you've got Team A that doesn't like the way we're doing business, and then you've got Team B that doesn't necessarily care how we're doing business. They just don't like Team A. That's right. Yeah. So if team A rolls up, you got to have team B, right? And now, now you've got to figure out how do you interact between your company's responsibilities and the message to both these guys who yeah. may get into a fray and it's actually worse than the original. Well, I, I think going back to your point earlier about communication and collaboration with your local partners, I, mean, I think that's, that's a big part of it. And you're kind of talking about the lab. And yes, I remember mm -hmm. those days and there's a picture of me page, I think of That's right. one of the newspapers oh, escorting huh. some 98 year old. You were that guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, in, and, in his full riot helmet. Yeah. Full, oh, he was full, just doing his job. Too bad as a 98 year old grandma. <laughs> yeah. but, no but, but, you know, the, I think the thing that the security, security, org security organizations really struggle with is threat intelligence, is really understanding and synthesizing data mm. and making right. sure. Because what are we always doing? Oh, we need cameras. We need alarms. Oh, we need yeah. access yeah, control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, yeah. you really need to develop threat intelligence because that's going to help you understand that that protest is coming. Yeah, and give you some of that time. And you yeah, already have preparation beats yeah. reaction. Any day. It, it, exactly. But how do you? But having good threat intelligence allows you to make those better risk decisions. You just, you just hit me, man. You just, you just, Dave, dang it, man. <laughs> It's what I do. It's what you, know, I do. It's, you know, it's amazing to me. Knee, it's amazing right? to me today. To today. Uh, and we just had, I know Rhett and I just had this conversation just the other day, how there's some major companies out there today still that have not done the simple thing as a quick, like, thyra risk assessment that mm -hmm. you can get from your old mm -hmm. spot, your mm -hmm. Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. Like they haven't even done you, anything you like that. You don't have to go out and create anything. To your point, well, no, they go have to no the standards. DHS website. They have no standards. <laughs> yeah. They have no procedures. Mm -hmm. No policies. Mm -hmm. Right, and they're dealing with all this stuff. But let me ask you a question though. Do you think that anybody can answer this? Do you think that is the biggest threat right now to a property like Department of Energy or something like that? Or are, are these the folks side. showing up? Some, yeah. some because. We're no longer we're no longer waiting on, on Russia coming in with multiple tanks in our fence line. Right. And you look at some of these fence lines. Yeah. Are like ridiculous. Well, there was a post. I mean, you go go to Menlo Park for Facebook, as you guys are well aware of. There's there that's got to be the only corporate campus in Silicon Valley outside of Apple that has a fence line. 
Right. Right. I mean, we go to the Googleplex and they're separate buildings, individual buildings, and you come to Facebook and and there are individual buildings, maybe like 2021, but you have these huge fence lines. And the idea, you guys know, is that they put the aircraft cable through the fence line, can't ram it, right. you know, yeah. hard to do. Get into the 4K. I, I guess so, pop up barriers. So I think there's a maturity or a transition, totally. right, between the use, use the NYPD or the LAPD policing model from the 60s and the 70s, yeah. right? We don't still use that playbook, right? right. We, we evolve, we assess, mm-hmm. we, we make things better. And I think physical security has to do the same thing. So, you know, to answer your question, we build physical security barriers and we train our teams. And the question that I always get in a loop or an interview or anywhere else is, so that's how are you going to protect my facility? And, and the, the non-security guy still pictures this Black Hawk helicopter with a bunch of fast roping <laughs> guys <laughs> coming yeah. down, doing a Tom Cruise thing through my air. Well, they picture dragons. <laughs> and I, I know. From Skinwalker. Skin skin oh, oh, yeah. They, nice they transition. transition. <laughs> that was, that was really Nobody here knows Groucho Marx, but it's saying the senior way today is dragon. No, really, but uh, but uh, so how do we get out of that mentality that it still exists? I know we need physical security, but we need smart physical security. I, yeah. I think it's it's going back to Scott's case earlier about that business case. Developing those business cases for your executives to better understand. Here are the threats, risks, and hazards that post our organization but that's based off of good threat intelligence right. that's where it all starts it, you can put in access control but if you are not protecting against the appropriate threats you're going to have a lot of problems right because you're not protecting against the black hawk helicopter right. now doe we were yeah, in yeah, some cases right? Some right we what were some places but but yeah. also it's somewhat industry specific right in some yeah. cases because the threats and hazards are different and i also think in my personal view that i think you really need to look at blending both cyber and physical into one 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 organization. That's just just my belief because the threats. Yeah. So to circle back to you or to <laughs> us, right? So if if it's not the Black Hawk, yeah, with the guys in you know mm-hmm. one of the Kung Fu yep. Samurai Panda Warrior yep. guys, yep. right? Who is our biggest threat? I mean, and it doesn't have to be the same for every organization. Well, I, think, I think I think I know what I think it is. Yeah, yeah. industry specific. It's, it's as specific as he said, but in the case of like when you're trying to do it, put in NERC SIP kind of security into, uh, the problem is that it doesn't totally cover the insider issue. This is where I was going to go. Yeah. 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 It doesn't totally cover the insider yeah. issue. And, you know, and, and we all suffered this through, through data centers, we're through data centers. Right. Um, just you, you mentioned this about even corporate meetings where things get leaked out of a simple corporate meeting. Right. You know, and I know there's a company where uh, as I'm sitting at, at a meeting, I'm seeing it in the news coming out. And it just, as a security professional, it annoys the crap out of me because what it's saying is so important to us as a group and as a company and as stock owners of that company right. that you would betray, you know, the, 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 uh, the sanctity <laughs> of this thing, this meeting that we're having where we're getting some good information, right? And share. So the insider threat to me in multiple ways, not just, you know, no longer just IA kind of, I'm sorry, I, um, stealing up proprietary stuff, yeah, proprietary IP, works, yeah. IP, IP yeah. Um, but everything else. So, dude, I know you, you're doing a bunch of sh- ship. Oh, that was close. A bunch of ship. A bunch of ship. On this kind of stuff, man. So, Inside a threat, still the issue. I think we don't pay attention to that still as much as we should today. I think we feel bad that we're going to point fingers at folks that we work with. We feel bad that we're going to suppress the ability for people to move freely, which then it makes them feel bad. You know, and you don't trust me. Right. Dang on, no, I don't trust but, you. But this is the, the challenge, right? I think we all agree insider threats one of the hardest security problems to solve right now. Yeah. And maybe already always has been. Yeah. But with when you, we all of our organizations that we work for um, collect information, and what we all agree is da- data is new gold, right? Mm-hmm. And so there are so many organizations that have vast amounts of data that needs to be protected. And the one thing that makes it really vulnerable is that person because we can't get inside their mind and know what any of our employees are thinking at any, any given time. Yeah. I think, well, I mean, and it's not for me, 
I'm a security guy, right? So I think security. Yeah. But it's not necessarily a security issue, mm-hmm. right? When you mm-hmm. think of insider threat, Thank it's you. just, yeah. um, you know, I'll use the example of, you know, a closed venue and you drive around the back of the Venetian theater and you see two guys with a milk crate, a door propped open, having a smoke, and then they go back to work, leave the doors open, right? So it's yeah. not, that is clearly the insider threat can be anything from operational failures to logistics failures to, you know, some companies have uh, relied on other people to keep their operations going, yeah. you know, and when, you, well, how about when you go to the gas station and inadvertently hit that power off switch and it turns <laughs> off the pump, yeah. you know, that's happened to other companies, yeah. you know, throughout the world with just no safeguards or no training. The, so. the thing that kind of horrifies me is when we talk about vendor security, right? Yeah. And while you can control, sorry, Malamon, um, while you can control sort of employees, you can do background checks, you can, yeah. Do certain screens. You can check Set their like, testing. Yeah. You can check their email. <laughs> yeah, send, send, sending and receiving things, what they search for on the internet. You know, you can kind of put controls around the people that you can control. The people that you can't control are the ones that I'm horrified about because you give them as much, if not more, access into your organization. Because yeah, everybody you wants, you know, Krispy Kreme. Yeah. You know? yeah. So the, the, the vendors that come in in the morning, like right now, you know, 7 a.m., can we pause this and yeah. go get some Krispy yeah. Kreme and come right back? Yeah. And is inside a threat mistakes? Like you said, oh, I left the door open. Oh, yeah. Mistake. Well, yeah. So or is it non education? Like yeah. I, I did not educate people enough on the importance of be vigilant yep. while you're still working, not only for yourself, but also observing others. Or now is that too, you, are you creeping on other people? Well, what, what's the resource for? Right, so we train all these people to do all these things. To your point, we train them: don't prop a door. You know, this is how you should uh, um, badge through every door. Don't badge doors through open. every door. Thing. But then, when they see something, they're supposed to say, say something. something. But how do they do that? Right, and that's well, some of the challenges. Well, yeah. I also think there's a you know, snitches get stitched. Culture. Yeah. yeah, I think there's. <laughs> I think there's a cultural component though to a lot of these because you have a lot of organizations and you look at their culture and nobody believes the bad thing will happen. Mm-hmm. As security professionals, we always know that the bad thing going to happen we just don't know when and that's part of the problem so when you're trying to convince ceos or employees why they shouldn't use that milk crate to prop that door open because yeah. that is technically an access point into our facility and that could create you know that's where the active shooter can come in or that's where the burglar can come in we have numerous but examples. most people but those two guys you pointed out just sitting in the back hey we're just here smoking like what's the big what's the deal, deal man? like come what's on. the big deal well there's designated places for that inside a facility Instead of propping our doors open and exposing both our physical assets and our intellectual property, but it'll never happen here, Dan. Yeah. Well, how do we fix? Right. It? How do we? How do we? How do we fix it or get better at well, inside a threat without pointing fingers at people right, or people right. feeling I that think, they're pointing right. fingers? I think you you have to. Or I would I would recommend looking at you know the, the probably the two pillars of insider threat. Right. You've got things that happen that are non nefarious. Right. Mm-hmm. They happen either out of a, a lack of training. But there was no no intent to necessarily oh, ruin man. your business, right? There was not the. I'm not going to go into CJ 101, but still, yeah. you know, mouse. And that's that's probably the again. We're all risk guys, right? Yeah. Most likely, most dangerous. Yeah, yeah. I think this this daily happenstance of I just didn't get it probably falls in the 80 percent to 90 percent category, and and the the frequency is high, but but the threat is low. I mean, right. what are they going to do? Right. Um, it's that other 10 to 20 percent that we probably need to, to retrain our teams on. But do you become big brother? Are you looking at everybody's every move? Somebody think, has to. Well, it, I think it, that's where it doesn't become because you were talking about security partners, right? It doesn't become just the guys in uniform anymore. That's right. It's, you know, I remember post 9-11. I don't know which agency necessarily, but there was conversation about having the fire department UPS, FedEx, the U.S. Postal Service, all training together because many of them have access into public spaces or private spaces, and they may go into a public space to deliver something, and stuff just is off, right? Right. What's all that ammonium nitrate doing there? Man, that looks like dead cord. Is that a blasting cap? Yeah. Yeah. So so were those those guys in the past would just go away and think, man, it's a weird situation. Now we've engaged our public-private partnerships or our security public partnerships to, to at least know what to look for. Yeah. And I think that's the same thing inside corporate, our corporate. Uh, we're not educating people. Right? Yeah, but I think, I think, it, man, God, you just, 
hit me up on another thing now. This this private corporate. That's why we're here. We got muffins. Yeah, I know. This <laughs> private corporate thing. I mean, I remember in 2016 or something like that, I went to a FBI put together cybersecurity meeting with one of the, the largest cybersecurity companies in the world. Um, and it was all about government and corporate partnerships. Mm -hmm. FBI really tried. And then you go and you sit down and you ask them questions about these. That's why I used to love the, the joint task forces or something like that, like uh, Nick Rick. Yeah. Uh, Nick right Rick in California. Yep. It was a really great organization because we openly shared stuff. Yep. But I remember that day specifically going to the the gentleman that presented in the FBI and said, hey, listen, we're looking at a couple of things, a couple of threats and stuff. And the guy was like tight lipped. They didn't want to talk to me at all. Yeah, I gave him my like business that. card. I'm at a security thing, a security meeting, right? I'm inviting them back to my office. Yeah. And they were still kind of, uh, and I'm trying to explain to this guy, hey, we probably have the technology and the money and everything that you guys don't have. Why can't we just work together and figure this thing out? But at the same time, don't look into my shit. Because we wanted all the help. Yeah. But, but just don't look too much. Right. into my stuff. Yeah. Is that the issue? Is that the reason why corporate and the feds, that partnership is very difficult because you don't want to get behind that. You don't, you don't want to get too close because then you know each other. So this goes pre 9-11, but I don't think there's a one size fits all answer anymore. I mean, much likely your Scott is going to be able to get a, a partnership with either the Maricopa County Sheriff's or a local law enforcement team, not because Scott's company has a great relationship with the county, but because Scott's First, just a stand-up dude personal. and he yeah. knows somebody and he's that can it. work within the rules yeah. and make it happen. And we need that same kind of mentality, yeah. you know, across the spectrum. And it's really hard to cultivate. It, the public-private partnership in regards to law enforcement is really interesting because it, it has evolved significantly since World War II. Yeah. Right? So what happened in World War II? God, World War II. Bro. You go oh, back dude, there? I, it's a history Jesus lesson. Jesus. Way back. Right. So we had, like, the Civil Defense Corps, right? And so not everybody in, I'll just talk about the United States. Well, Civil Defense Corps, that was your next door neighbor. Co correct. Right? Yeah. Neighborhood, neighborhood Watch on steroids. Just, yeah. just for people that don't know. I mean, I, I didn't know until a couple of years ago. So but why, why, where did that come from? Right? Right. So like, I'll go even just pre uh, World War II, you know, there was a fervor in Europe. There was a fervor in Asia Pacific, you know, that we in America were concerned that we had walled ourselves off from uh, that I'll go into a little bit of geopolitics. We had walled ourselves off because World War One was so bad for us, right? And then we went through a recession and all these things. Bad stuff happened throughout the 20s and 30s. So we oh, World Bank was put together, which but this is this will come out of World War II, right? Yeah. So the, the th leading up to World War II, America's looking inward, right? We're we're walling ourselves off from the rest of the world, yeah. and so what comes out of that is we had kind of I won't say a weak. But we had a small, much smaller military, obviously, right? For obvious reasons, we weren't, you know, sailing the seas and doing the, the security stuff. Yeah, that we, we weren't do a today. power projection country. We no, were, and so were, you, when you want to protect the protection. homeland, how do you protect the homeland? You know, do you rely on the border patrol, which was non-existent, uh, maybe non-existent there? We had a very open border. I know, at least for our state, it's forty-eight state, the greatest state. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, hashtag Arizona. Hashtag Arizona. <laughs> So, you know, we, you can. <laughs> Go, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, dude. You know, you, we're called State 48 for a reason, right? Um, so, 1912, we become a state, right? Yeah. We, and, but really before then, we were a territory, obviously, but you could come across the border from Mexico yeah. very easily. We shared. That's why Fort Huachuca was so busy. Fort Huachuca was very, yeah, absolutely, right down there on the border, Bisbee, all those mm -hmm. great, great cities. So you ha we generated this, this um, hey, we got to protect America fervor. Yeah. Like this is this weird dude with a weird mustache in Europe and he's starting to invade people, other countries, and we just don't know what he's going to do, right? And so Americans being Americans and patriots said, we're going to protect our communities. That's the least we can do. I can send my sons off to war, but I'm a farmer. I'm going to grab my shotgun and go, you know, essentially patrol my neighborhood, right? And so out of that, came people who wanted to protect themselves and their communities. And I think there are very few, and of course, law enforcement starts to become much more professionalized after that. Um, bigger cities, obviously, much more professional than smaller communities, but smaller communities started getting more 
into law enforcement throughout the 60s, 70s, right? We come up, we got the drug war in the 80s and 90s, uh, terrorism in the 2000s. And so we all started looking at like, how do we protect our communities? Yeah. And so you, and then companies throughout the, the maybe the, the early 90s um, started going, hey, we also need to protect our, our, our businesses. Yeah. And so now they're put putting them together. So in addition to companies looking at things, yeah. I think much like right after 9-11, communities and individuals back in that era were much more willing yep. to trade off civil liberties yep. for I'm going to be safe at home. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Look at TSA. And, and we're not at that. We're not there today. No, no. We're not there. Oh, today. I mean, the public's changed tremendously. You wouldn't get people to think like they were thinking in World War II times. No. Like, I'm going to protect my hood. Yeah. You know, in that kind yeah. of sense. Yeah. Today, people, I, I know my next door neighbors because I literally, I seek yeah. to communicate. So I, hey, oh, hey, what's up with guy, a brand new guy over here? Pleasure to meet you. You know, I walk over. A lot of times they don't reciprocate. No. So imagine a neighborhood. They don't, they don't know what you're doing. Well, they've never had that before. So right. imagine, imagine in neighborhoods today where everybody is kind of, especially in the past two and a half years, I don't really talk to anybody. Yeah. Like, don't yeah. bother me. Correct. You I don't know your next door neighbor. Why would I care to protect my next door neighbor? That's right. Nobody cares. No. Nope. You know, that's and one of the beauties. And there. it's only getting more like that, right? And so we're drawing out of the rural communities or we're coming into the cities as people. Right. There's a reason why people are escaping. You know, we can't find people to farm, let alone people to drive for Uber. Right. Yeah. You know, but people are starting to condense into more metropolitan areas. And, and so when to kind of this is a long way around for the public private partnership. There are certain. Oh, God, you're bringing it back. Yeah. 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 Oh, dude, oh, it's Uber, coming. Yeah. It's coming. Well, it's coming. Yeah. It's oh, because it all, it all it's links right. together. You remember that. that's the beauty of it. <laughs> Most intelligent guy in the room behind rap every single time in day. I'm just happy to be here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but it all it all links together because then you have now we have our law enforcement partners and, and we all kind of come out of that world. We understand that world. We understand what it's like to be in law enforcement. Law enforcement doesn't necessarily understand us or what it's like to be in the private sector, right? Yeah. And while we get it, and many of us still have or can have clearances and things like that um, that the government would require, there's only a few agencies that really do well to communicate with the private sector. And I think the FBI is one of them. I don't yeah. give the FBI much, but I really do think, and because I, I was on their task forces, I was on a couple of different task forces with them, and I got to see them evolve since September 11th, right? right? And so they became very much like we're the white collar um, terrorism, uh, uh, you know, counterintelligence force to, hey, we want to partner with corporations so that we can keep them safe as well. And and not every field office does that well, to no, your point, that's Carlos. True. And the, the problem now is people don't realize, because you made the point brilliantly earlier about, is it, the relationship is about a person. I'm just as surprised as you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But the relationship is about the person. Yeah, right? it is. And, and so you have um, agents in the FBI that get moved every years right. sometimes yeah. those positions are he's on his way out he is know? and by the way that's what they look for uh, if they're smart agents they're like i need to be on the public private partnership side hey you know, so i can find the DSAC. Some, yeah they call it dsac right the, mm -hmm. uh, i forget what it stands for but whatever it's it's their uh, osac equivalent yeah. osac is state department dsac is FBI. yeah you go to their academy you go to their citizens academy but if they're smart they want to get to know you right, right. where's the good right. job out how do I get? Yeah, yeah. They do that through meeting vehicles like InfraGuard. Yeah, InfraGuard's another thing. Yeah, they're they're, they're one of the only few federal agencies that actually. But, and this is how come InfraGuard like, is not as big as like the local task force groups? It's it's tough, right? I mean, it's tough. because I, you know I'm a member, but but depending it doesn't on, affect me as much as like a Nick Rick. Nick Rick communicates way more. That, well, that, way more it, it, but this is, comes out but of Nick Rick people. owns more intel. I think. And you think Nick Rick's good? J Rick's even better. Right? Really? Yeah, yeah. J Rick's a LA version of yep. Nick Rick. Yeah. I think J Rick's even better. And the reason why I say that is I through J Rick, I got TLO, ILO, mm -hmm. and one other. Break that down for people who may not know. TLO is Terrorism Liaison Officer. That is for law enforcement officers who want to be the liaison officer to the any of the terrorism agencies. Um, you know, CIA, DIA, yeah. FBI, those kinds of things. 
Um, and then ILO is the civilian equivalent. Which is the one that I, I see the most. It yeah, does, it yeah because matter. you're an ILO. Well, right? Right? You're exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's, yeah, that's the one I see the most. As a matter of fact, Texas is the same way. Uh, our guys, our team members in Texas are like, hey, can we just do this ILO? Yeah, absolutely. Well, absolutely. ILO is, is really – you're because you're supposed to get a background check on mm -hmm. those things. Yeah. Right? I got ILO and TLO when I was a federal agent, so I didn't like have to do all those extra things. But that was the idea: was we'll we'll background all these people, and then we can share information with them. Right. Whether they share information or not is kind of tough because depending on your industry, you're saying like it's a so what factor essentially. Is yeah, what I was taking for you. You know who's communicating? Why do they communicate? Don't they communicate enough? Uh, depending on your industry. You may care about international happenings. If you're in some type of more locally focused industry, you may care about, you know, what's the gang down the street doing? Right. You know, not necessarily what's the terrorist in, in some other part My of the My favorite world. word, geopolitical. Yeah. You're not looking geopolitical. You're looking local political. Right. You know, and th but this is the failure point. Because really, when it comes down to it, all things are local, right? Yes. Where you guys have facilities, where I have facilities, I care about in that that location, what do the police say is bad? Right. What's going to happen? Because we may have a global platform. That's it. But there's global intelligence isn't going to do any good. Right? Yeah. No, you I, don't need to, I don't necessarily That's need it. to know what's going on globally. I yeah. need to know need what's going on between, you know, 57th and, you know, 3rd. And this is a very easy to solve problem for America. Let's talk about international. When you have language disability. Or language abilities. Right. Um, when you have different cultures that are, are happening, you have different other geopolitical issues. How do you involve OSAC in that? To help OSAC's great for that, though. To take, yeah. to take the, that partnership, yeah. that kind of global companies that are doing global business, right. and connect them to that local area and help create those local partnerships. Right. You know, it's funny because until I came to a global company, OSAC to me was just something I, I heard of. Sure. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't important. It was a concept. Right? Yeah. Like I, there was no need for it. My challenge with OSAC is, um, I, I don't think I can belong to multiple, uh, regions. Branches. Yeah. Right. Regions. Like I've got South America on my, or, or yeah, North and South America, I believe on them. but I couldn't also belong to APAC. Right. Right. Or there's something like that. But, um, everybody, I've not been to the OSAC, um, conference. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a little. Bit, I think was the last. Yeah, year. and yeah, I think there's a little bit of competition with GSX, but um, yeah, as far as like when it happens, yeah, yeah. So people have to choose. I'm going to this one or this one. But everybody who I talk to that goes to the OSAC conference loves it. Yeah, they get so much more from it. And I think State Department or DSS did a really good job with partnering with those international parties. Mm -hmm. But that's still very international, right? And then how do you come that's back true. to being? You know, I care about what's happening. That's the that's an even harder nut to crack, um, or or really tough to to find places. Um, you know, certain regions of the world, it's hard to find any information. Out well, I'll try to find information without going there. Skinwalker Ranch. That I just <laughs> yeah. see how you brought it back to Skinwalker. <laughs> just, Ranch. Look at that. Seamless. No, so another so boomerang. So I'm sorry, man. Just but, but dragon kills me. Dragon. You know, I looked them up on LinkedIn. I did too. Dragon, if you're listening. Uh, just stop. Just, just I, stop. Please. They okay. show up, man, at a gate with ARs and, you so know. So for people who follow along at home, Jim, <laughs> <laughs> Skinwalker Ranch is a show on one of those streaming networks. It was say who. Oh, yeah. And it's, it was, I watched episode one and then I, I almost turned so it off. Tried it through. Network. It's the Trident Network. No. <laughs> it's, so everybody, know, everybody knows what Skinwalker Ranch is. It's in Nevada. There's a lot of weird things that happen uh, on Utah, Utah. Ranch. Utah. Or Utah, you're Utah. right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and a lot of weird stuff happens. The one in Nevada we couldn't put on cable. No, no Area 51. Right. So the, <laughs> the they they did what I that thought. That ranch we can You got it. That's a different ranch. It is a different ranch. That, they did this uh, thing that I thought was going to be a documentary. It turned out to be a reality TV show, right. <laughs> essentially. And uh, so what Carlos, you're talking about is in this kind of first episode, um, you have a group of scientists who are going to go to Skinwalker Ranch and all these terrible things have happened. Cattle mutilations, weird UFO sightings, weird things with lights, weird things with sounds. Yeah, everything. Yeah. And, and so they're, they're, they played up in the first part of this episode one. The safety is a big concern. 
right? You can't you can't go there because weird things happen. Weird things happen. People get hurt. People get hurt. And so the 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 principal scientists, the principal investigators, show up at the ranch for the first time. By the way, there's a there's a very nice Euro European helicopter in the episode, and a, a all black, all black, yeah, all black, like, you know. a Lamborghini Countach oh, is God, in the episode. Yeah. Like, no, no Osprey, no. no Osprey, no. But the, <laughs> the owner of the ranch really likes to show himself he off does. as somebody that's made it. Made it. He truly has. You know, I'm a middle class guy. Grew up and grew up yeah, and, you know, and made it. So now I drive yeah. Lambos. Here's my Lamborghini. Yeah, here, right. yeah. yeah. And so here, here is my. What are, Comes into to I guess some small airport somewhere. Yeah, goes, yeah, you know that's the jet. That's <laughs> it's <true>. true. <laughs> like, the jet has nothing to do with the story. Like, take the Eurocopter. But you are going back to how security is portrayed. Well, this public, is the right? problem, right? So, so as you guys are are aware, because you all seen the episode, you meet the the quote unquote head of security, and I'm like, I'm now I'm like, oh, maybe who I know this who? guy. Who, well, who is this guy? I, I actually didn't know that. Security was even going to be a part I didn't of this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as soon as that happened, I think yeah. like you, I was like, "Oh, yeah, okay." It, until they started using his his call sign, which is, by the way, this is this is a, a white guy with a black beard, yeah. right? Trying to look as commando as possible. All black, I think. all yeah. black, yeah. all the all, time. All black. Where's all black? All black all the yeah. time. And he's not Johnny Cash. No, 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 definitely not. And his call sign is Dragon. Dragon. And I, I almost turned it off at that point, but I said, let me, let's play it out. <laughs> let me just see. Maybe the devil's I'm, advocate. Yeah, let's, 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 maybe yeah, it's going to get give better. Give it a chance. Give it a chance, right? And sure, sure enough, like you guys are saying, the, the first episode, they go to the ranch and the security team meets them. And these are, this is Dragon and Dragon's partner, who's got to be, I don't know, seven, eight feet tall and as wide as a bus and the biggest corn fed white guy I've ever seen. He's carrying a shotgun. Big guns on. Big guns. Big guns. Uh, and Dragon's got a rifle with no optics. Just saying, I noticed that. No, no taxling either, by the way. No, and he's just holding on to they're it. Both, they're all wearing like gloves. Like, he does all black gloves. That's right. The, the tactical tactical fingers. Driver's gloves. He's wearing driver's <laughs> gloves. Driver's gloves. Or 98 degrees out there, hot as shit. Yeah. Uh, they shit. Just, but, but you know what's amazing about this? This was just, So let's talk about risk. Let's look at the scene where they come in. So they come in this helicopter. <laughs> they land a helicopter in the middle of the site. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and all of a sudden, the camera pans back to the security detail. Mm -hmm. And there are these two security goons, okay, <laughs> with, with like ARs, and, you know, whatever, shotguns and everything else. And I'm like, what's the risk? You know the helicopter. And they're close, you know too. Who's, oh, they're, yeah, they're like right on them. <laughs> you know who's coming. You know the helicopter. You know that there's going to be a film crew there. You know there's going to be, like, so you know that they're doing that 100% for show. Hollywood, yeah. man. I mean, it has nothing to do with no. the risk that that a helicopter that is known with people inside that is they are known and vetted, and so, that are expected. landing in the center of your property, and you know, that have clearance to be there at the yeah. time to be there. But Hollywood wants to portray it as it's super dangerous to be there, and these guys need really big guns. Right. I don't know what you're going to shoot with that shotgun, by the way. Um, the rifle is a good weapon to have on a ranch. I, I, I get that. But it was totally – it's just Hollywood missing the mark yeah. again. That's not security. No. It's not – what What's the risk shoot? to those scientists? If, <laughs> if you're protecting those folks, yeah. what's the risk to them? Yeah. Why do you need all that, yeah. right? Like there's, and there's by the way, a whole keep, lot of. Are you keeping other people out? Or yeah, you them in? yeah, yeah. If, let's say if it is true, and they didn't do that for the cameras, and I'm one of those scientists, right? I literally show up like, the hell is all this? Yeah, what, is it that dangerous? Because if it's that dangerous, if this is like, I need to go. If this is, you know, I don't know, man. If I'm about to be in the middle of a war. Yeah. Right. I'm not prepared. Uh -uh. Like, this is not where I need to be. Is that what you're telling me? Should I'm I be out. wearing a vest? As a matter of fact, or? hey, keep the helicopter on. Yeah. We're coming back out. Let's go. What book did I forget to read? Like, yeah. what? Yeah. But, but this is the problem when Hollywood adds this perception that security uh -huh. is big guns, and guys dressed in How black, many times ninjas. have we seen law enforcement guys? Yep. Right? I, I'm, I'm crossing the street in New York City or in Mayberry. <laughs> right? And Mrs. Phillips brings Timmy over to the law enforcement officer and says, can you lock him up? He's not listening. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, you're the bad guy. Right? Yeah. What are, we, are con we are consistently portraying security as a, as a enemy of yeah. 
you know, normalcy. Yes. Yeah. When security should be everybody's partner. I mean, some yeah. companies do the white glove, concierge, yeah. customer service based security. Others don't, you know, for reasons that, that maybe meet their profile. Sure. But security has to be embedded as a partner inside your wire and outside your wire, yeah. or nobody's going to go to them. That's right. You know, exactly. I tell all of my guys, if somebody can't come up to you in the in the micro kitchen or in the snack bar and have a cup of coffee and have a conversation with you, when they've got a, a thought in the back of their mind about whether or not they can talk to security, you've already alienated it. That's right. Because the only time you ever talk to them is, hey, fix your badge. Hey, shut the door. Hey, yeah. you know, wow. do this. Lord, yeah. And that can't be our deliverables. You know, and that just can't be. Plus, plus that image of Dragon um, <laughs> is is seared into the minds of all of the employees of the organization. Yeah, right? they think that's what and, you look like. Yeah. And the leadership. Yeah. So it makes it harder as security professionals when you're trying to justify certain security measures in your organization because they immediately go to, I don't want Dragon. Yeah. I don't want that. You're going to be like that guy? Are you gonna, on that TV really show? No, that's not what I'm saying. But some of us have worked in, in private security mm-hmm. where one person on the team wants to go that route. Yeah, right? that's right. They yes. fantasize about, yes. they over project their whatever. Correct. And they want, you know, hey, how can I get guns? Right? I, I, yeah. I, I, we need more guns. Yeah. Yeah. I want your guy out on the perimeter to have a gun. Right. And and then yeah. we talk about risk, talk about liability, yeah. talk about all that other stuff. Yeah. But I, I just don't think well, if I ever had the choice other than, you know, DOD and some of the other stuff, right? Mm-hmm. There are places where you need it's appropriate. an armed response. Yes, I agree. But for 97% of what we do, it is a liability that I just am not willing to take. It just makes it so much harder right. for me to educate. Because of the uneducated, yeah. they think I need a dragon. Right. And I'm, when I'm tired of telling them, the risk doesn't, it doesn't show that. We don't need any of this stuff. Exactly. You know, the, none of this, like the, you're talking about risk transfers, risk acceptance. It's harder for me to explain to them, look at the insurance covers a million and we only have 500,000 worth of merch in there. I don't care. But, you know, but it's up to you. Yeah. Kind of thing. But it just makes it hard to educate. I don't know where I was going with that. But it just makes it hard to educate whenever. They, maybe it's a trident cough. Wow, well, this thing is literally <laughs> got me pumped. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, don't mean, I don't mean to segue into, into something that you talk about, segue. Lot, which is transition. Oh, People yes. transitioning from you. your public sector agencies into your corporate security entities. Oh, that's have, a great topic. Have a misguided perception mm-hmm. of what that really means. Because they saw it on We've all done it. they saw it on right? Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah, because they saw it and they're like, oh, well, that must be what I'm going to go do at X company. And then you get there and you're like, what is your biggest hazard? Well, I'm trying to keep my doors closed because people, people keep propping them open. That's my, <laughs> biggest, homeless, that's my biggest problem today. The homeless, homeless need a place to sleep. Yeah. But I, I don't need Dragon to yeah. fix that problem. Exactly. <laughs> well, but you know, the funny thing is, so... Going on a transition, there's a lot of folks, kind of like Dragon, that come out of the military and stuff like that, and they transition into high positions within companies, right? All of a sudden, I'm sitting in a meeting, and they want a armed vehicle with four people inside that are totally armed to be like a, I don't know, a Cure. react team Cure. Cure. in case something, yeah. yeah, in case something happens. You know, and I'm like, what are you, what, wait a second, what are you talking about? Right. We have a QRF. Like it's called 911. Yeah, yeah, like you don't need it. We have great part, local partnerships. We should talk about it. You know, we, we have great we partnerships. And by the way, here we go. The biggest thing why I don't want my folks with guns, are, because it brings me a tremendous amount of liability that mm. I want nothing to do with. I'd rather pass the liability to the folks that are <laughs> insured to do so, yeah. yep. have the right and the law behind them. I don't have any of those things. Mm-mm. An offshoot of, of this is in, in regards to transition. Oh. It's very good. Yeah. You get the last one, Carlos. Oh, snap a do. I licked it. You licked it? <laughs> he kind of doesn't care. There's more. Oh. Oh. He'll eat it. Man, there's more. <laughs> but wait. There's there's but more. wait. For 1995. But go ahead. We Sorry. have uh, donuts. So the in regards to transition, we're talking about how... And we've always been talking about how we're going to see a tremendous amount of people coming out of military law enforcement oh, yeah. in the private sector, right? Because we're all too young to retire, and for our generation of retirement, it will be a fantasy. But we have the whole baby boomer generation that were hired in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s that are all hitting retirement age, and they're gone. 
Right. They're We're like, living longer. We yeah. have more debt. Yeah. Right. right. Whatever the yeah, whatever the reason, whatever is, the reason. Is we will continue to work. So you can't retire and then go do nothing. Um, especially when our baby boomer generation is, is doing that. They're starting to retire and start, we're starting to lose them. I was just listening to something about Phoenix PD. They're offering all these hiring bonuses. They pay the highest in the Valley, so on and so forth. They're, they're taking people from everywhere. And they are. Mm-hmm. They're down 500 officers. Yeah. That, that's a big city. You know, Jerry Williams is a big Six, city chief. Biggest city in the country, I think. Six or uh, the biggest, the fastest growing city in the country. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, but we're in the top 10 as far as population goes. Yeah. And that's just Phoenix, let alone the oh my gosh, area, yeah. right? And we have probably one of the biggest sheriff's departments in, in the United States, so on and so forth. But the problem is nobody wants to do that job anymore, right? So as you're losing people to retirement or to transition or whatever it is, you're hemorrhaging people. Where are they going? Well, some of them are going to the private sector for sure. And we were just talking about you know, making that transition, not being that dragon type character, mm-hmm. um, or, you know, thinking security is all about the biggest gun that I can carry. Right. right? So there's definitely some conversation that we need to have there. Mm-hmm. But to your point, Ray, um, I, I believed um, that we would always be able to call for assistance. If I need help, I call, or if I have a fire, I call the fire department. Yeah. If I have a security issue, I call the police department. Right. And so what how does that affect us is more of a question for the group. How does the lack of law enforcement officers out there affect our ability to call that kind of quote unquote QRF? And will we need to have a private sector solution in the future? I don't know. And not that we can answer that, but it's it's kind of similar to why is there a, a shortage of workforce in general right now? Right. People either stayed home with COVID or they don't want to do X kind of jobs. Right. Uh, I think to try to not make this a political conversation, a lot of the discord that's going on right now about deflending organizations. Um, we heard a lot about that when the sound bites were easy, but I don't think we've seen a lot of that in practice, similar to how you see candidates run for president. And then when they get in, they don't do what they said they're going to do because now they're inside the looking glass and they yeah. know why we needed those things in the first place. So right. defund the police. Yeah. I think we need to get the word out that what we need to do is maybe educate our law enforcement teams to be more aware of, you know, health and human services, mental issues, things like that, and what the appropriate response is. Right. But we are going to need people coming into those jobs. Well, yeah. that, that goes back to the, the recent launch of the 988 line, which is the national crisis line. So that's supposed to take some of the burden off of our law enforcement partners mm-hmm. and kind of move it over to that crisis response or whatever. But I, I agree with you 100 percent. And because I also, you know, help train law enforcement right right now in crisis response, um, there's a lot of organizations that are moving to pairing police with mental health professionals right. all over the country. Yeah, like, that. and it's a great. I think it's a great pairing because. They have sent, you know, and I, I'm a bit biased because I work with cover response teams now, but, um, you know, when you're sending out two people, especially in today's environment where it's pretty violent, I mean, they've sent out social workers who have been murdered, you know, unfortunately. Yep. And that's not what we want for our mental health partners. We want to make sure that they're safe, but we also right. want to make sure that- Just the, like that fire doesn't let us in uh-huh. until they, they remove that threat. Well, or right. they, they won't go in until we clear the stage. stage. <laughs> but, I always stage. Ask, but I always ask Five this because- away. We already know that law enforcement, unfortunately, has been behind the curve in all this mental health stuff. Yeah. It was just thrust upon us a long time ago. Like, hey, you're 911, you handle emergencies. But where, because law enforcement's behind in some cases, what does that mean for corporate security? Yeah. Oh. You have all kinds of people yeah, coming back right. into the workplace right. that are suffering from depression, anxiety, because they've been locked up for two years. And now they're coming into the workplace. What do you think your biggest challenge is going to be from a corporate security exactly. perspective now? I was not thinking about that when I was grabbing a muffin. Oh, that's just, we were talking about the insider threat. Muffin, yeah. mental health, right? Both ends. How how do how have we addressed our public in the past? And if we're still using the same model pre-COVID, post-COVID, I think the whole return to office playbook had to at least pivot or add an but appendix. Can I, can I before we go to return to office, because there's a lot of good stuff there, man. So let me let me go back a little bit. Um, one. I remember going to police academy and the classes that we took on mental health issues, I think it might've been 40 hours. Might've been, I'm going to go with 20. 
might have been 20 hours that covered all of the psychological issues that I was going to meet while on the show. Yeah. You name it. Yeah. And I, obviously, that's not enough. So I, I always thought, why not up that in the police academies? And then we don't have to really necessarily bring in people that deal with those kind of crises because we're putting them in a tough position. Sure. Right? Okay. So if we up that and we become, at minimum, a certified something. Yeah. There's a smaller certification. You, you can get a, yeah, your sub-certification. And I don't know what that is, right? Yeah. CIT. Wouldn't, a CIT, right. uh, which, yeah, CIT, right? So why don't we do that automatically right away so people understand what's going on? And then on a second, how come the military does a great job with this? Mental health issues yeah. with the military folks. Yeah. It's, it's probably one of the best. I, I think that's because well, you law have law enforcement doesn't have it. No, no, and this is the real law enforcement doesn't have it. Yeah, at least with veterans, you have the VA, right? As many problems as all, all of us have had with the VA, but at least you have an outlet for for some place for them to go and, and get them into programs. And, well, like and, and as a as a director of emergency services or provost marshal inside the military, yeah, all of all of our let's say departments or or garrisons or communities had inside of the law enforcement network, yeah. a family a victim yes. advocate. Yep. Yes. Right? See? So exactly. those advocates were a part of the healthcare facility, mm-hmm. but they were also assigned to your uniform staff. Right. Right. And I'm not saying that we had one for every patrol or one for every shift, but we did have one that would make sure that the training or the recurring training Ombudsman met, met, met the industry standards. But, but we don't have that. That's my public public so that's some of, some of the biggest issues. So two thoughts that I thought was that if I up in the, in the academy or training the the psych part of law enforcement to deal with the psych issues, right? One, I probably learn a little bit about myself as well. And second, out of my you know, I used to work three two two three three two when I was a cop. And how come every other week when I do three twos because we were eighty four hours, how come I can't take one hour away? Because they would let us work out on shift. That's cool. so we came in, right? You get your little radio. You, you so just take your top off band. You pump it up a little bit. But why can't we take that away one hour every two weeks on a pay that you have to go and see a psychologist? Yeah, some mental health. Just to let some stuff. shit out. Yeah. Because on my first day as a cop, man, I went from being a normal human being to dealing with a guy that shot himself through his head. Yeah. It's not normal yeah. for anybody. Right. You know, and I remember going home that night, calling all of my buddies, acting, you know, as yeah. cool as I was. Right, right. But I remember when we went to the hospital with it because he just shot himself. So we go to the hospital. I'm sitting at the, I'm doing the entire report. For the first time, I'm sitting right next to a dead body mm-hmm. for hours on end, waiting for the the uh, ME to to clear everything and take everything away. And I'm like, holy shit, man! You know, and and then the trainer, the trainer goes, hey, you, you told me you really want to learn about this stuff. Well, uh, our our. <laughs> Got to. Our, you our, to. Our, uh, our, our, uh, 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 what the hell is it called? CSI. Yeah. She's coming in to you photograph to, the body. To, no, to sw- swab the, the hands, make sure it was. Oh, yeah. GSR. Yeah. yeah. So do all this stuff. So he goes, yeah, go, go ahead and help her. I was like, oh, uh, shit. So she goes, hey, go ahead and grab his arm, you know, lift it up and help me. Sw-. And I, the first time, I've never touched that body, man, right. you know? And there I am, you know, holding the dude and he's staring at me because his eyes are still open. Like, nobody thought of closing his eyes. I see that in the movies. Yeah. Right? Somebody dies, they go, Yep. And close their eyes. Mm-hmm. Like this dude is staring at me with a hole in the back of his head. Yeah. Anyways, you, gotta, can, you know how do you cadaver spasm, right? Guys <laughs> yeah, still got his. Yeah. I'm sitting over there doing paperwork. And the guys moving, you know, some gases are being released or whatever. Yes, yeah. they are. And you're like, hey, hey, he moved. Hey, <laughs> that was not me. <laughs> well, anyways, but that kind of trauma, I don't think you forget, and and you see a lot of that in law enforcement. But, but law. this, and what's interesting in your your. When we're talking about public safety people, they're usually over the age of 21, right? Yeah. yeah very limited experience yeah. where they're younger than that. But they're usually between, you know, early in their career, 20s to 30s. Well, in Florida, so it was right? 19. Yeah, right. Time. And I think a lot of those things have changed. But this is what I'm talking about. Like the, the dichotomy is, okay, veterans come in at 17, 18 years old. Yes, they do. And because we've been at war, I know this has changed recently, but because we've been at war the last 20 years, we've, we've got... Folks who are coming right into the military and then they're deploying and they're going downrange and they're seeing all these horrible things like yeah. what you're talking about. And they really haven't even matured their brain. Yeah. Right? Our brain doesn't really mature till what 25 or something. You're the psychologist. 
Mine is at least my, four. I, 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 <laughs> mine I'm, I'm never going to mature, so yeah. I don't know what you're yeah. talking about. <laughs> my, but that is interesting because, again, there's not a lot I know, right? I know beer. I know some scotch or whiskey. I don't know Cigars. Cigars. And, uh, I'm, I'm a follower. By the way, is it too early, early to have a drink? Or but, uh, no, it's right never. It's 5 o'clock but, somewhere. But in the military. Oh, yeah. grab me a we, little something. We, we lock these, these guys down from mm-hmm. being citizen recruits. Correct. The third week, a lot so of 20, 20 days, yeah. you're getting a, an M16 or yeah. M4 in your hands. And you've got that in your hands from day 20 yeah. until, you know, probably four weeks later. Yeah. Every day. Yep. Right? Carrying it, literally. Carrying it, loving it, yeah. learning yeah. it. Yeah. No, and, I'm good, I'm good. And that's a that's a huge adjustment for right. a lot of people but who did not come out of that environment. The, the thing that I would say, especially what Carlos was saying, that culturally... I keep going back to the culture of first responders just in general is just like the military. There are a lot of parallels between our military counterparts and our first responders Yes, when it comes to mental health stuff, right? But for years and years and years, what did, what did we always hear? Whether you're in law enforcement, fire, EMS, military, it didn't matter. You know, um, you know, if the military wanted you to have feelings, they would have issued that. Oh my gosh. One. And then number two is, is what's the other part of it? It's if, you were always discouraged from bringing anything up. You were told to do what? Oh, are you, what, are you, what are you told to do? Sure. Suck it up. Suck it up, man. Drive on. I remember touching touching dead bodies when I worked at the PD and having to straighten out uh, so a guy sweet. who was who was riggered out. Grab and, your first. Slogan. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, that's one of many memories that you just don't want to ever have. You don't, you don't forget those things. But I believe personally, especially from my time in law enforcement, Bring it, in. it is a leadership. It's a leadership. Leadership needs to model, you know, why, or leadership should model being more open about talking about mental health issues. Absolutely. Because what it, what is the big fear of our, our police officers in particular? Well, I'm going to lose my badge and my gun if I say right. there's anything right. wrong. I'm going to be labeled a head case, or I'm going to be labeled by my partners as somebody they can't rely on. Yeah. And and if you're in the military. Yeah. I'm going to lose my PRP clearance. clearance. I'm yeah. my security Especially clearance. if you're taking I'm, psych. I'm a pilot. So, I can't fly. This, right? These are really psych meds. Yeah. Automatically, right. you're like, and you can't do some jobs. No. That, but this is but, what I'm talking about. And it's like, wait, you take the meds so you can operate jobs normally. Right. I don't take the meds because right. I'm going to be more crazy. I actually operate to bring me back but to again, the level. We're still working on the 1970s NYPD and yeah. NYPD yeah. playbooks, right? Yes. Our, our but, assessments haven't evolved. Which, by the way, their neighborhood watch program was key to start. But if you look at if you look at demographics, <laughs> two in five in just the general population has an undiagnosed mental health condition. Mm-hmm. I would say Ooh. three and four. I, at this I would say I, well, <laughs> yeah. a, I would say four. I, know I'm four. Four. Right. I would say one hundred percent. But I know the drugs. I no do. undiagnosed. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> but <laughs> but those same folks are the ones that are going our military services yeah. those are the same ones that are being becoming first right. responders which means they already have like people don't realize how mental how mental uh, health issues are so prevalent but yet there's that stigma about talking about it, right? right so i think i think if we have more open conversations around mental health especially in the first responder community you have to you have to yeah. because that's that's going to reduce there, our, there two our issues suicide here. numbers etc the, the two issues is there an administrative issue when we're talking about you know any kind of mental health issue in, a, in an organization, right? And we're specifically talking about military law enforcement. But, and then you have an, you have the administrative issue, and then you have the, the how everybody else perceives that issue, right? And so not only do you just have – everybody says, oh, nobody wants to be on the rubber gun spot, right? And be assigned to desk duty and all that, all the, the very old terms that we grew up with, right? But that's, that's only one component, and that may be the biggest component depending on the person. But I think the thing that we can control is that administrative issue, you know, where where you start removing somebody from a duty because they're having a challenge and going through something. And by the way, public perception plays into that as well. Right. You know, no chief of police or, or police administrator wants to be allowing the guy who's on psychological meds to be on the street, right? Or the person that's having a psychosis. But if I'm problem. a city administrator or if I'm a chief of a law enforcement agency, huh? Which I have been in the military. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You've got two or three pillars of an individual's identity. Right. Right? And if I remove his ability to work, at the same time, I'm trying to get him healthy enough to be capable of working. I'm actually giving him a double burden to deal with. Without a doubt. 
So I think as a as, a, taking as away an administrator, his I may take him off of armed patrol. Right. But he can still be an asset. Right. His experience is still very good. As long as you keep treating him like it. Yes. Asset. Well, right. but how many? How many? We all know this. Me in particular. And I'll be open here. I got suspended one time and went home for a week with pay. Mm -hmm. And I was on a, you know, we don't, we don't run after bad guys in Florida. So Carlos did because he almost got run over by a car. And I was still in trouble. Anyways. <laughs> but you know what they do? The first thing they do, as we all know, they take away your gun. They take away your badge, right? And they say, while well, you're sitting at home, wherever you go, whatever you do, call your sergeant, let them know. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait a second. Now, now I got a house. Now arrest. I cannot move freely either. Yeah. Because I went after a seven time felon. Yeah. You we, know, we just have to get better at some But stuff. but look we do. look at what we do after OISs. Yeah. You 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 segregate that officer. Mm -hmm. You take away their gun. You have to you do all this stuff. You don't allow anybody to talk to them. It's not the union. Well, that's the same thing. Uh, exactly. Don't but, talk to but, anyone. But you're you isolating that poor officer right. who's trying to figure out what I just what did I do wrong? People, like, Man, you know, they're, they're getting better now. You're not wrong. I hope they so. are. Yeah, I hope they better. I, mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't there, really. there's a lot of you know having having dealt with it from a, a special agent. You know, when I, I was the first agent on scene with a with a, a drug smuggling incident, active or a, a shooter. Uh, the suspects were still on the wind, and we had uh, a deceased uh, military member, and um, he was the, the the most senior person on that in that element. And I'm the first person there. I'm dealing with 18, 19 year old kids that yep. just saw their their chief get get killed. And you know, to, to your point, like we immediately had critical care there. She was she beat me to the scene. Peer support. Peer support. Yeah, thank you. Yep. And so we did a lot of things to try and help them. The problem is, do we continue that right? And and so like we have the VA in, in military, right? You can at least continue your your care and your counseling. We don't have that in public safety. Yeah, but, but how many times? How many times you get that care? Like you just said, right? Three days in, I found you. Hey, I'm good. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. good. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Thank you. I'm good. Yeah, let's no let's compound go back, thirty let's go year career. Yeah, I'm good. I'm yeah. good. But you still have it in your mind for years. Yeah, it never leaves because you. none of us. We don't want to. I don't think anybody in this room ever wanted to go sit at home. We mm -hmm. wanted to work, mm -hmm. and I know that I wanted to go get. You don't want to sit at home because you don't want to think. Work was a distraction. Yeah, yeah correct. Correct. because if you're sitting at home, what are you doing? You're just constantly it. replaying that same incident over and over. Well, over correct. And over. So where, where I wanted to get to was because here I, I did I poured a little shot for us to have a nice drink. Oh, by the way, some nice garrison of Texas uh, bourbon. So, Thank you, to the U.S. Excited. Marshals. Oh, well, there you go. Brought that. <laughs> hey, there you go. Oh, wonderful stuff. But think about this: we literally have to turn to alcohol. Well, yeah, we, we shouldn't do that. No, but I mean, uh, I'm just pointing, pointing, not, not me. We're not doing it now. Now we're having a drink. <laughs> so, so, but no, a lot of I, law enforcement officers, they, they do. Because not, they not to overly generalize, but, gen, yeah, but, not, to, but not to overly generalize. But there are people who self medicate yes. to, to suppress the pain of the memory or Absolutely. get to sleep at night or anything else. Absolutely. And it used to be a thing. Like, if you were caught, at least in Florida, as a police officer or deputy, if you were caught drunk driving, yeah. which happened so often, right? You would just say, "I have a psychological problem. I need to go see the psych." And that's how you didn't get fired. Oh, that's good. At least you, at least you got help. That's <laughs> help. You went and got help instead of being you know, getting fired. So, yeah. um, but I wish they would take care of law enforcement a little bit well, more. But all of these things, the military folks, because I, I think they do a better job. They do. Mm -hmm. I think. Well, as only, bad as it is, the only, as bad as it is, they the do. Only, the only thing the military doesn't do well is when you have folks transitioning out of the military to the back yeah. of civilian. Yeah. Correct. Because when you go into the military, you you get reprogrammed to do the jobs that the military wants you to do. They do a very piss poor job about deprogramming you to go back to civilian life. Transition is, is very, very difficult. And there's no mandate that makes people go to the VA to get care. It's like, here's a bunch of, here's our t transition assistance program. Here's TAPS. Here's a bunch of PowerPoints. Go check it out. Hey, if you need the VA, go ahead. I, when I got out of the military, I didn't know anything about the VA. It took me six years to even learn anything about the VA. That was in the 90s. Yeah, but right. and I think they do a better job today. today. Yeah. But the problem is, there's no real, real handoff. Now there was some legislation. I don't know if it got passed, but there was a legislation tying the DOD systems to the VA system. So there's that automatic transfer of records. Oh, your records. Like and then leave, that would trigger automatic. Yeah, yeah that would trigger the VA to reach out to that veteran at their last home record or whatever. And that would be great. However, you know, we talk about shortages in police work, but there's also a huge shortage. 
and this whole 988 thing going back to that honestly i don't know that the infrastructure is not there there's you know there's a lack of mental health facilities because if you go to la county where, where i do a lot of stuff what's the biggest problem there's no bed space we so, would, uh god you just reminded me sometimes i have to drive all the way up to sanford and i used to work down in altamont springs mm-hmm. when i was a deputy because they just didn't have any bed so i had to bring it up behavioral health all the way up in sanford and then they would have to put a bed together kind of thing in the hallway wow you know because they just couldn't even in seminole county where i work so but there's going to be more of that because we don't have enough people in healthcare. Just but overall, I mean, there's, there's a lack of mental health yeah. professionals like all it's over the so place. Hard, man. It's but, so hard to do that job. But if you're Oof. but if you're pushing this national crisis line, which I think is a great idea, I don't I don't have any issues with it. But if you're pushing this national crisis line, you need to have the infrastructure to be able to take in all of those folks mm. that are routinely in crisis, right. right? So if you don't have that, then what do you have? You have a situation where you have borders in your emergency room. Now emergency rooms are going to get overloaded. They are. They are overloaded. Yeah. And behavioral health is already, at least in the 2000s, you know, when I was a cop, it was already overloaded at the time. And we talked about this the other day. Florida used to be the pill mill. Really? Oh, Florida, man. People used to come from all over Kentucky. Because they would just write scripts. Because they would would write, who would sell, you know, I remember stopping a guy one time. He had a a bottle like this. It was a count of 500 oxycodone. Who gets prescribed no. 500? Like you literally get maybe a 30 day or, yeah. right? And then that's a 500. That used to be the pill mill. I mean, anybody can look it up. Um, so what, what started happening in Florida is that people would run out of money, run out of uh, drugs, and they would literally go to the behavioral health hospitals and say, I want to kill myself. Yeah. Just to so come in for three days, get some shots to help mm-hmm. them because they knew they were about to feel sick, mm-hmm. right? So that helped them for three to seven days. And then they would go back out on the street and do the same thing. But that's taking away the bed from somebody that that's truly right. has a behavioral health need. Right. So that's what was happening in Florida a whole bunch, man, in the 2000s. Well, we the, we can't say that we're blind to this or we don't know what's coming. Because there are good examples around the world of how behavioral health is impacting generations, right? Or the current generation. Take a look at Japan. Japan is very concerned. Right? They have an aging population. And they have a young population that's not coming up. By the way, China's even worse. Mm-hmm. By the way, like really bad, like collapsing society bad in China. So in Japan, what have they done to solve the, hey, let's get the mental health treatment? Believe it or not, Japanese culture really accepts and adapts well to technology, as you can imagine. And so they have artificial intelligence and robotics that they're using to help people deal with loneliness, right? Mm-hmm. Especially when you have, you have more females than males and uh, the males are not finding the mate that they are looking for. So you have social, or you have uh, artificial intelligence and, and robotics that are playing a huge part of that, that socializing themselves and getting out there seeking mental health treatments and, and trying to help them cope with, with whatever the loneliness or whatever mental health issue. And coping, yeah, as we saw during COVID, right? The social media platforms increased exponentially. Correct. Yeah. In, yeah. in their applicability and their use. Yeah. So yeah, I was totally like TikToking. Yeah, yeah, that was me. <laughs> that she did. Well, it's just that connectivity because you couldn't go to the office, could, right? Yeah, and you didn't. You weren't able to do that. But we got to be mindful of this, at least when we talk about government and, and how we enforce, you know, COVID protocols or pandemic protocols. We got to be mi- really mindful of this for the next one. The next one is right around the corner. Yeah, we're not going to avoid it. So it's I, coming. I don't know if we have a, a stop go panel, but I'm gonna. You know, force dump, right? Stop. Because if we start going down the COVID <laughs> well, rabbit hole, we probably hole, got like we a, probably a good never... another eight minutes or so. I'm looking at your yeah, I get... oh, your watch there. One twenty four. Yeah, it's probably about eight minutes or so. I think we should you know, keep on recording. Ball. Yeah, just because. Should we do it? An intro that you can cut in, since we just all started bullshitting. Like who who you are. <laughs> I mean, I could, I could, when I write it, everybody, nah, I'll yeah. write everybody's name and what okay. they do yeah. and the companies they're attached to. And I'll definitely tag these guys because this was good stuff. Great man. coffee. Yeah, this is good stuff. So, Tremendous. Uh, I enjoyed it. Um, I'm probably going to get more of that. And my wife, dude, she's really into this yeah. cold brew coffee. Yeah, it's oh, so man. good. That's her thing. Yeah. It's, it's like, so I don't know where, right? Mm-hmm. And she, you know, she, my, my wife does every, love you. Um, she loves to just order stuff through like Instacart mm-hmm. and they drop everything off. Mm-hmm. I'm getting boxes of cold brew, oh, wow. nitro cold brew and everything else. So these, these things still have it. 
Yeah. I think they I think they uh, they work with Nova. Yeah. And uh, they uh, they'll deliver these things. Nice. Yeah. So we have definitely got to take a look at that. But uh, I don't know. Got a couple more minutes, guys. We talked about a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, there was I had a note here for event security. I'm not sure we got there, or wanted to go there or not. But um, I think we sort of talked about that with like protest. Yeah. And I, and I know yeah. I know when you talk about event security, you're talking about like you know maybe a, a setup event. Like you're, sure. you're going to have like an event in an event hall, and how do you protect your executives? And how do you oh. protect all that stuff. But right. I, I would I would classify a protest as an event. <laughs> yeah. Whether it's, it's a, a party. planned or an it's unplanned. It's a party, yeah. Right. It's a party that I was not invited yeah, to. But so it, speaking about that, and we kind of go back to our law enforcement partners, can we really truly rely on them to be there to support our event or our the security? It's, it's all being done with, I think, off, over time, off-duty yeah. ODS. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I'll, I'll use an example. So you know, I'm doing work at a university right now in Jersey and had uh, their first uh, commencement of sound graduation in three years. And I had reached out to our law enforcement partners and said, hey, could you just do some? And this was right after Uvalde. So everybody's all already jacked up from all these different shootings. So I said, hey, would you mind guys just mind going through periodically? Because I already know agencies are shorthanded and I don't know right. if they're going to have the ability to station somebody, right? Thank so goodness your Arizona partner is there. That, that's true in, in Arizona. In Arizona. Um, but what was interesting is the agency they dedicated to it right out front yeah. and uh you know we made sure we took care of them we fed them we watered them we made sure that they were they felt welcome at the event yeah. you know didn't didn't you know but it was necessary to have those folks there but i also didn't expect them all i requested hey just roll by i know you guys are probably short handed you know and that's also being flexible from a corporate security perspective like hey yeah you know, I, I know that you guys are having challenges so we're going to work with you and figure out the best so what right. you said was really interesting in that they were welcomed to your event. 100%. Right. Because depending on where you are oh, right, in the yeah. U.S., that's right. Um, I know I've I've well, had pushback at multiple agencies or multiple locations yep. when I thought I was doing the right thing, you know, starting early, developing mm-hmm. a relationship, doing yeah. walkthroughs, having them come by for social hours. And then your team members will come up and say, hey, yeah. why is he here? You know, is he looking for speeders? Is he work, searching a warrant? Is he yeah. so? Yeah. It's that cultural cross-functional I, ownership. Of, and, and let me be clear: from a security perspective, we certainly welcome them. Absolutely, hey, glad you guys are here. Oh. And they showed up initially, and they didn't check in or anything because nobody would make them. But I specifically went out there and sought them out hey, and said, "Hey, are you, you know, are you guys going to be stationed here? Oh yeah, we're here for the whole event. Oh, awesome, sweet. So the least we can do is take care of you. Yep. But I also think at that point in time, because of national events, even if people had a preconceived notion about folks and didn't want them there, I think that because of national events, they probably kept their, their stuff to themselves because right. they were like, well, you know, even though I may not like them, I'm glad they're here because now yeah. it, it, I feel it, a little safe. It, it, it potentially impacts me, right? So Interestingly enough, and you said something earlier that I think uh, we never got back to, it's, there are definitely some places where law enforcement cannot happen. You know, there are plenty of companies that are opening up office spaces or whatever, data centers in places where small towns, small cities, where they have a very small contingency of law enforcement folks that would even help if something happens. And you mentioned something that I thought was interesting. I talked about this before. Will the security industry ever become law enforcement in a way or ever given the power, at least within your property, to act as law enforcement? In the future, because we're going to be so short of law enforcement, real yeah. law enforcement yeah, yeah, yeah. certified state folks. Well, but the, 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 I totally don't have to pay them more, right? Yeah. Well, I, I think look, you've got to pay security. You got to match security pay with uh, law enforcement. Which, uh, you know, that's a bit controversial. Or at point, least right? fast food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or at least fast food. Either way, you get what the solve for this this global lack of having people is going to. You got to pay them more, right? Or you got to give them better benefits. Or so that's kind of thing one. Thing two is the government will be the last person to the table, always. Yeah. We will go out and solve this as a as a uh, private sector entity, mm-hmm. and we will find a solve for it. Right. Always. Yeah. And then the government will be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Right. six to one, ten to one of security yeah. officers versus law enforcement. I'm going to say that probably every single police chief or sheriff, yeah, or state trooper commander or whatever, will probably fight it. 
They're, they're doing it right now. They'll, every time, every time, if you say, "Look, I can certify my folks to yes. the same law enforcement the academy." Standard. As a matter of fact, the academies would love to take more students. Sure would. You know, because they're making money. Yep. I'll certify them. They'll have all the state certificate. They'll take the state tests and everything else. Correct. They will only work my area, yep. and I'm going to create this body of law enforcement folks that only work my fence line. Right. I think you you have to do that. I mean, federal service or federal government, federal property does that right now, right? They, yeah. they do. They do. They have they have um, you know, security officers that are armed and do patrolling and those yeah. kind of things. But the the hue and cry. We see this in in high net worth neighborhoods. You guys see this in San Francisco. They see it in L.A. Oh, okay. Beverly Hills, right? Where you are hiring uh, former law enforcement military or off duty law enforcement to actually sit on your street corner dressed as security, armed. To protect you from bank, from robberies and all kinds of violent things, that's the new normal. Yeah, yeah. right. What well, a San Francisco PD guy that retired San Francisco PD guy yeah. just got killed in San Francisco oh, while doing security work mm-hmm. for a community. Oh, okay. Well, and, and it just we had, happened. We had Buffalo as well. The mm-hmm. Off duty or a retired Buffalo police officer encounters a suspect with a rifle, tries to shoot him with a pistol, loses the gun battle uh, tragically. Right. And so the chief of police from Buffalo was like, this is why we got to get rid of guns. And it's like, not even a good guy with a gun could stop the bad guy with a gun. And it's like, that's a very unique situation. So, you know, and that's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And not to get all into pro 2A, mega 2A, but the, the, the private sector is demanding people with money, by the way, companies have money, uh, high net worth individuals have money. And when their stuff is in jeopardy, they can't protect their supply chain. They can't protect their 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 home, their property, their business, their customers, whatever it is. They're going to pay more money to have that done. Yeah. And so this is what our law enforcement partners don't see is when I've got more security than, than law enforcement, what do I need you for? Will my insurance be cheaper if I have security it's, that it, has guns? This is the big thing <laughs> that insurance needs That's to catch up. You know what right? I mean? So we've done some work in the... In where insurance companies are going, hey, you can, you're like an all-cash business and you got all kinds of products people would want to steal. Maybe we should do an assessment of your, your operation, right? And so we get calls from, from insurance companies to come do an assessment. Right, because the insurance companies are not set. They don't have the expertise, the know-how, the manpower to go and do a threat, a TDRA, a threat assessment, right? The security professional. Right? So insurance companies are finally starting to realize like, oh, we should, before we give this organization or we cover them liability wise or with, with our own money, we should understand what kind of standards yeah. should we make them follow. Yeah. And they do do this in international shipping and, you know, you've got Lloyd's of London and they, you know, which that's a whole nother thing with Russia. But anyways, the, the, the current secu- uh, insurance industry is just starting to realize. Like, oh, we can make them have a standard. Yep. I can make you do stuff. I'm not going to insure you unless you do X, Y, Z. It used to be, you know, that you don't do certain operations. You know, like if I'm going to insure, we do, we were just talking about this. We do with our insurance companies for our businesses, right? And they, my insurance um, company said, well, do you do security consulting? And I said, yes. And they said, okay, well, we're going to add, we have to add a rider to that, right? Yeah. You, have to, you pay more into your insurance. To, to do those kinds of things. Like, okay, that makes sense to me. But they asked me, do you have armed guards that work for you? No, I don't. Okay, well, you don't pay for the armed guard, right? Or whatever. Yeah. Right? right. And so insurance companies are just starting to realize that they can do more than just say, do you do X operation? Because I'll get more or less insurance because of that. Yeah. yeah. And what they're saying is, or what I, where I think we're going to go, is to say, okay, uh, if you're doing X operation, that has X risk, you need to do X assessments. And then out of that assessment are going to be recommendations. And here are the well, recommendations. Or maybe you just have certification bodies. They, They'll go out and certi- certify a business. And they already do this. Cyber. Right? Under the certification. That's yeah. The insurance. They already do it with cyber. cyber. ISO standards. Yeah. 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 ISO, right. Cyber. And there are physical, by the way, great, great point. As us as security professionals really got to tie in with what are the regulations? What are the, uh, what uh, compliance issues? Have. What kind of certifications can we yeah, go out and achieve? Yeah, right. When when I worked for a tech company in Silicon Valley, 
they were involved in a government pro program called CTPAT, um, Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. And they loved it. They were like, this gets us through customs really fast. We've got this fast track pass. And I'm like, okay, cool. And they're like, well, you, you, you're a Homeland Security guy. You take it over. And I said, okay, uh, what have you guys been doing? I'm like, what do you mean? So there's all these requirements. We have to do these things. What are you been doing? Find this stuff on the other side before you. I've been self-certifying for yeah. ten years. They haven't done any of it. They just said they were doing it, and I was like, "Oh boy, that's, that's we got maybe bad." Yeah, that, that's, that's that is bad. bad. But this like, is what I'm talking about. Like, okay, if you want to be part of this program, you really do have to do these these things yeah, out there. Saying, absolutely. So. Well, and that's like a lot of these organizations when they go at work work with the federal government. They Mm -hmm. And that's a whole program. that's a whole yeah. animal. But you know the difference unto, is unto itself. The difference in that is that they the government actually comes out and audits. Yeah, correct. And that's the same thing with So yeah, right. But obviously for eight years they didn't come out and audit. Yeah. No, but I did a lot of work to get them to that point. I said, let's just review on paperwork. Yeah. Just always check yeah. off. Yeah. yeah, they were and they were. But we did a lot of work. The government came in and audited us. We yeah. passed. They had a few things that we needed to do. Nothing that would shut us down. Yeah, because that's the big thing corporations unless you have the right person running that stuff yeah they don't understand that the government can turn your lights off they sure can. yeah you know is fed a great example of yeah. that oh you're not doing xyz well you're not doing business anymore yeah you know yeah and and that's it down well let's, let's uh, do write it. it down i'm gonna turn this off in the last 30 seconds just stare at you guys because it's, it's a heck of a lot of fun I, I hey but this is fun we should do this more often i yes. think i think every time we have an opportunity to just get together you know somebody bring a mic Get the cameras. We can uh, roll on. There's so many things that I think we could have gone into. Tip it's of the iceberg. Just, there's just no way that you know we could cover this in all, all at once. But I enjoyed that we went into a bunch of different things, man. It wasn't just security-driven stuff. It was about life. It was about psychology. It was about making a couple of industries better, the military and, and law enforcement, man. So um, I like an open talk like this where we're just rolling with it and seeing where the hell we go. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Very cool. Cool. All right, man. We'll see you guys.